One issue that at least our viewers are generally excited about today is the Snowden case. A man who is now being dubbed a second Assange has exposed total surveillance practices employed by the American government. There are two sides to this story. On the one hand, that was classified information, which makes this man a traitor. But on the other hand, the information he has leaked is of crucial importance, primarily for the American public and for the world in general. What do you think of that? He told us nothing we didn't know before. I think everybody has long been aware that Signal's intelligence is about surveillance of individuals and organizations. It's becoming a global phenomenon in the context of combating international terrorism, and such methods are generally practicable. The question is how well those security agencies are controlled by the public. I can tell you that, at least in Russia, you can't just go and tap into someone's phone conversation without a warrant issued by court. That's more or less the way a civilized society should go about fighting terrorism with modern-day technology. As long as it's exercised within the boundaries of the law that regulates intelligence activities, it's all right. But if it's unlawful, then that's bad. Mr. Obama said rather gaudily that you cannot have 100% security while maintaining 100% privacy. Yes, you can. I'd like to reiterate, you do have to obtain a warrant for specific policing activities domestically. So why shouldn't this requirement be valid for intelligence agencies as well? It can and it should. As you probably know, it isn't Snowden or Syria or Turkey that has been top news in Russia this week. It's your divorce everybody has been talking about. Both yourself and Mrs. Lyudmila Putina explained it at length when you spoke to the press after a ballet performance, but a few questions still remain. I wonder about the religious aspect of your divorce, and this is something many people are questioning at the moment. First of all, I can tell you that Ludmila and myself agree that it's much more appropriate to be open about our actual state of relations than try to keep it secret. That's what they say in the press, too, regardless of political affiliation. Well, thanks for that much. As for the religious aspect of our marriage, there is none, because we never wed in church. You didn't wed? No. Thank you. Salam Adil is deputy editor-in-chief with RT Arabic. Salam, you have the microphone. Thank you, Margarita. Actually, I only have occupied my present position for a week. Before that, I spent 20 years working as a reporter. I have traveled particularly all over the world, including many conflict areas. I haven't lost my sense of danger in the process, and that's why I'm still alive. Thank God. Yes, thank God. God bless you. Thank you very much. And my question concerns conflicts, too. I mean to ask you about drones. Unmanned aerial vehicles. As you know, America employs drones to deliver airstrikes almost on a daily basis. This happens especially often in Pakistan and a few other countries. Drones are arguably a very convenient means of warfare. There is no direct engagement and no risk of your rank and file. It's all remote controlled, like a computer game. However, this is something we see in the news almost every day. This kind of warfare is fought with massive casualties among civilians. So, on one hand, drones are efficient in combat, but on the other hand, we're all aware of the collateral damage. The public in many countries have found this shocking, and there has already been a motion for imposing an international ban on using drones. I would like to ask you about Russia's attitude on the issue. Thank you. Gunpowder was originally invented in China, and no one's managed to keep it from spreading ever since. Then came nuclear arms, and they also started to spread. Modern means of warfare keep evolving, and they always will. I doubt if it's possible to simply ban it all. But you certainly can and should introduce certain rules and exercise control. I'm sure the United States does not target civilians on purpose. And the drone operations you have mentioned are people, too. And I think they understand all these things. But you still need to combat terrorism.
I know they're currently debating this issue in the United States, and a notion is being advocated increasingly often within the UN framework that you need to put drones under control. You need to lay out certain rules of engagement in order to prevent or minimize collateral casualties. It's extremely important. I don't know whether our Western counterparts will choose this option, but I would suggest it would be in their best interest. However, there are other threats too. For example, they are presently debating the option of using non-nuclear ballistic missiles in the United States. Can you imagine how potentially dangerous that is? What if such a missile were to launch from somewhere in the middle of an ocean and get spotted by a nuclear power's early warning system? How should that nuclear power react to a missile coming its way? How are they supposed to know whether this missile comes with a nuclear warhead or not? What if the missile impacts right next to its border or inside its territory? Do you realize how perilous that can be? Or take the notion of low-yield nuclear weapons. Do you realize how badly that can blur the very boundaries of using nuclear arms? Or how low the threshold might sink for authorizing such a strike? Can you imagine the possible implications? Where are the limits for lowering that threshold? And who's setting them? There are many threats in the world of today, and there is only one way to address them efficiently, that is, working together within the boundaries of international law. And now we'd like to give the floor to Peter Naval, who is the presenter of one of our most popular shows, Crosstalk. Peter has worked with RT since its very beginning. He will be speaking in English, and I will translate the question for you. Thank you, Mr. President. My question will be very short here. It seems like we live in the age of opposition. Um, and when we have the Arab Spring, we heard about Europe and the crisis there. Um, and the Occupy movement in the United States, which RT did an excellent job in covering. But what about the opposition in Russia? Public opinion polls show it's very small, not much support. What kind of opposition would you like to challenge you? Okay? And the role of Mr. Kudrin. Shall I translate it for you? No. Well, opposition can be useful. You just mentioned Occupy Wall Street. At a certain point, we saw the police cracking down on the Occupy Wall Street activists. I won't call the actions of police appropriate or inappropriate. My point is that every opposition movement is good and useful if it acts within law. If they don't like the law, they should use democratic means to change those laws. They should persuade voters to join them. They should get elected into legislatures so that they can have a chance to change the law. This is the way to change things on the ground. If there are people who act outside the law, then the state must use legal means to impose law in the interests of the majority. That's the way it's done in the US, and that's the way it's done in Russia. Truth be told, we're criticized for that, but when the same thing happens in the US, it's considered to be normal. Never mind that it is double standards, we have got accustomed to this and pay little attention to it. When it happens in the US, RT grills America. You do the right thing. Everyone must be treated in the same fashion because these two situations are identical. The only difference is that our diplomatic missions don't actively cooperate with Occupy Wall Street, and your diplomatic missions work together and directly support Russian opposition. I think this is wrong because diplomatic missions must forge ties between states and not meddle in their domestic politics. Getting back to popular movements, reckless behavior is not appreciated by people. If these activists are breaking the law, then it's illegal. If they express their will by legal means without breaking the law, then they're fully entitled to do that. In this case, it would be beneficial to any state because it's a way to provide grassroots feedback on state policies, whether it be social, domestic or foreign policy. As for Mr. Kudrin, he is my long-standing associate. We see eye to eye on many vital issues of Russia's development. And that's for an obvious reason. We've known each other for a long time now. We worked together back in St. Petersburg, and then he became a member of the cabinet and proved to be one of the most efficient ministers. I've always backed him on key decisions. If I didn't, he wouldn't be able to work to implement those ideas and principles that he promoted. So, to a certain extent, that was our joint policy. He has his own view on certain things. It so happened that they had a disagreement with Mr. Medvedev on a number of issues. And since Mr. Medvedev was president, he had the right to take the decision that he eventually took. 
Today, Alexei Kudrin says that he is ready to rejoin the executive branch if the authorities were more decisive. But he's quite reluctant to specify what he means by being more decisive when I ask him to. Why? Because more decisive means taking tougher steps. For example, in terms of the pension reform, in terms of raising the retirement age. No one, including the opposition, wants to speak about it to the public. They think it's the right, but they don't want to talk too loudly on the issue. Also taking tougher steps on other issues like slashing budget expenditures and social spending, first of all. Many of our liberal economists think that our social expenditures are too high, that we raise salaries and pensions and social benefits too fast. They point out that the growth in real disposable incomes is unjustified. Last year we had a 4.2 percent increase and it's up 5.9 percent in the first four months of this year already. They argue that salaries are growing faster than labour efficiencies, which is bad and dangerous for the economy. There's no denying it, and they're absolutely right. But maybe it's best not to decrease real disposable incomes, but rather to improve our labour efficiency. Russians often say that the goal is not to expand the amount of the wealthy people, but rather to reduce the amount of the poor. This is a very hard thing to do, and the best part of the opposition has admitted this to us in private and professional meetings. But publicly, they're afraid to speak about it, and this is wrong. I have told them many times now, if you stick to some idea, you have to be straightforward about it. Don't be afraid that some part of the nation won't like it. If you're to garner more support for your ideas, you have to stick to your principles to expand your electoral base. Look at Western Europe today. They brought their countries to the edge of bankruptcy. But whenever they talk of lower salaries, people are up in arms. So it would have made more sense to increase your social spending and debt more gradually. Also, it would have been great for the authorities if there had been someone who could have told them about it. I don't think our social spending is too high. I don't think that we increase pensions, salaries and social benefits too much. But generally, Mr. Kudrin and other people like him have a point to make, and we need to listen to them. It's very useful. Useful. So I believe that an opposition that has the national interest at heart will be in demand. Next question is from Oksana Boyko, the presenter of our new show. She moved into presenting after several years of reporting for RT. She too went to many war zones. My question is a follow-up to your previous reply concerning principles and a principled position. I would like, however, to apply these notions to the Iranian issue. Iran will be holding a presidential election soon. I know that Russia doesn't like to meddle with domestic politics of other countries. That's why my question would be as general as possible. It's more of a philosophical kind. To me, Iran is a great example of how you can create extreme tension and mutual relations by blowing out of proportion some insignificant differences. The Iranian nuclear issue that everyone's been talking about for the last decade basically relies only on some vague suspicions which year after year have been dismissed even by Americans themselves. But that rhetoric has ignored the fact that Iran has been compliant with the non-proliferation regime by 99 or even 100 percent. The mainstream focus is on suspicions, but at the core, as I see it, is the relationship between the U.S. and Iran. Tehran is partially to blame for the tension build-up, but the root of the problem is the stance of Washington, their signature foreign policy principle, friend and foe divide, meaning that if you are not their ally, you are their enemy. And it seems that the level of tolerance to dissent is quite low, and when it drops too much, we see threats of war based on groundless suspicions, as is the case with Iran, or resistance to war, as is the case with Syria. Russia has a good record of avoiding tension in relations with other countries. Your public statements indicate that you know the cost of enmity, or rather open confrontation. However, I believe that Russia and the U.S. have ideological, fundamental differences on the use of force in particular that no private media meetings can resolve. It all stems from the national idea of the U.S. They believe they have a higher responsibility, which is actually just a bigger right. So where is the line for you between avoiding an all-out confrontation that could have an impact on Russian security and maintaining our principled position, which could too be critical to our security? I didn't quite get. Was it a punch at the U.S. or Iran? She's our tough guy. 
Вы знаете, на этот вопрос можно до утра отвечать. Response to your question could take hours. It's so complex. I will try to be as concise as possible. First, I've repeatedly voiced Russia's official stance. Iran has the right to a peaceful nuclear program, and it can't be singled out for discrimination. Second, we need to be aware that Iran is located in a very challenging region. I've told our Iranian partners about that. That's why Iranian threats made towards neighboring countries, in particular Israel, threats that Israel can be destroyed, are absolutely unacceptable. This is counterproductive. This is not a proper quote of the Iranian president. It doesn't quite matter whether it's a proper quote or not. It means it's best to avoid a wording that could be improperly quoted or could be interpreted differently. That's why the focus on Iran does have a reason behind it. I have no doubts that Iran is compliant with the rules, simply because there's no proof of the opposite. According to the latest IAEA report, Iran has been abiding by the commitments it has taken up. True, there are some outstanding issues, but with due patience and friendly attitudes, they can be resolved. I have a great respect for Iran and a great interest in it. This is a great country indeed. You don't often hear this attitude mentioned in relation to Iran, but it's true. This is a country with a great culture, a great history, and is a great nation. They're very proud of their country. They have their own understanding of their place, both in the region and in the world, and that's something you have to respect. You've grasped the core of the problem. Iranians are very smart and cunning politicians. And to a certain degree, they have exploited this confrontation with the United States. They are not the only ones. They're extremely crafty in this, and they do it to tackle their domestic political issues. When there's an external enemy, it united the nation. But I guess the United States have been employing the same technique. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, there have been no external threats that would allow Washington to dominate the West. There must be a threat so that the US can protect their allies from it. This position yields political and economic benefits. If everyone relies on one country for protection, then this country is entitled to some preferential treatment. So it's very important to possess this status of a global defender, to be able to resolve issues even beyond the realm of foreign policy and security issues. I think the US has been using Iran for this very purpose, that it is to unite their allies in the shadow of a real or false threat. It's quite a complicated issue, but it's not an issue for Russia. We've been complying with our international commitments, including on Iran's peaceful nuclear program. As you know, Russia built the Boucher power plant in Iran. We've completed this project and are prepared for further cooperation. Yet when we proposed to enrich uranium on Russian territory, our Iranian partners refused, for reasons unknown to us. They argue that they will enrich uranium on their own, in line with existing international regulation. And as I said earlier, if they don't break any rules, they're fully entitled to do that. We will endorse this right, but we will also remain aware of the concerns that other states and the international community has concerning full compliance with these rules. Can I clarify something? The thing is, I was asking you not only about the U.S.-Iranian relations, but also about the U.S.-Russian relations. Would you agree that we have fundamental ideological differences on key issues of international law? So right on the eve of my meeting with Barack Obama, you are pushing me to make some serious statements. It's a very important issue. If the country thinks it has more rights than others, I thought you wouldn't notice my deviation, but you did. Indeed, you are very persistent. To date, we don't have any significant ideological differences, but we have fundamental cultural differences. Individualism lies at the core of the American identity, while Russia has been a country of collectivism. One student of Pushkin's legacy has formulated this difference very aptly. Take Scarlett O'Hara from Gone with the Wind, for instance. She says... I'll never be hungry again. This is the most important thing for her. Russians have different, far loftier ambitions, more of a spiritual kind. It's more about your relationship with God. We have different visions of life. That's why it's very difficult to understand each other, but it's still possible. But That's why there's international law to create a level playing field for everyone. 
US is a very democratic state, there's no doubt about that, and it originally developed as a democratic state. When the first settlers set their foot on the continent, life forced them to forge a relationship and maintain a dialogue with each other to survive. That's why America was initially conceived as a fundamental democracy. With that in mind, we should not forget that America's development began with a large-scale ethnic cleansing, unprecedented in human history. I wouldn't like to delve so deeply into it, but you're forcing me to do it. When Europeans arrived in America, that was the first thing they did. And you have to be honest about it. There are not so many stories like that in human history. Take the destruction of Carthage by the Roman Empire. The legend has it that Romans ploughed over and sowed the city with salt so that nothing will ever grow there. Europeans didn't use the salt because they used the land for agriculture, but they wiped out the indigenous population. Then there was slavery, and that's something that's deeply ingrained in America. In his memoirs, U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell revealed how hard it was for him as a black man, how hard it was for him to live with other people staring at you. It means this mentality has taken root in the hearts and minds of the people and is likely to still be there. Now take the Soviet Union. We know a lot about Stalin now. We know him as a dictator and a tyrant. But still, I don't think that in the spring of 1945, Stalin would have used a nuclear bomb against Germany if he had one. He could have done it in 1941 or 1942, when it was a matter of life or death. But I really doubt that he would have done it in 1945, when the enemy had almost given up and had absolutely no chance to reverse the trend. I don't think he would. Now look at the US, they dropped the bomb on Japan, a country that was a non-nuclear state and was very close to defeat. So there are big differences between us, but it's quite natural that people with such differences are determined to find ways to understand each other better. I don't think there is an alternative. Moreover, it's not by chance that Russia and the US forged an alliance in the most critical moments of modern history. That was the case in World War I and World War II. Even if there was fierce confrontation, our countries united in the face of a common threat, which means there's something that unites us. There must be some fundamental interests that bring us together. That's something we need to focus on first. We need to be aware of our differences, but focus on a positive agenda that can improve our cooperation. America and Russia's relations with the US are important issues for our network, largely because Americans make up most of our audience. If you simply look at our website's hit statistics, you'll see that most of our audience comes from America. So anything related to the US is a key topic for us. And here is Anastasia Cherkina, who has specially come over from New York for this meeting. She works at our US-based channel, RT America, which caters to an American audience and focuses specifically on American issues. Is that right, Anastasia? Yes, thank you. I've lived in New York for the past five years. You have mentioned the fundamental differences as well as the common features that Russia shares with the United States. I would like to go back to our diplomatic relations and the present issues of international law. When I meet American politicians and Russia experts these days, I often hear them acknowledge off-record that the Magnitsky Act has effectively come to replace the jackson vanik Amendment, which demonstrates the same outdated approach towards Russia. As we know, when Barack Obama met with Mr. Medvedev during the summit in Seoul last year, he made some hints, saying he would have more flexibility after re-election. I see you guys just don't get off their backs, do you? This is the last question, I promise. This always happens. Obama hinted that it would be easier for him to cooperate with Russia. However, that is not what we are seeing today. We've already touched upon many of our remaining issues with the U.S. Why do you think the reset has not worked? And can it ever take place in the first place as an equal, reciprocal process? Or is it that Russia is always expected to sacrifice its national interest? Any state pursues its national interests, and the U.S. is no exception. What's unique here is that the collapse of the Soviet Union left America as the world's single leader. 
but there was a catch associated with it in that it began to view itself as an empire. But an empire is not only about foreign policy, it's also about domestic policies. An empire cannot afford to display weakness, and any attempt to strike an agreement on equitable terms is often seen domestically as weakness. But the leadership cannot afford to display weakness due to domestic policy considerations. I think that the current administration realizes that it cannot solve the world's major issues on its own. But first, they still want to do it. And second, they can only take steps that are fit for an empire. Domestic policy considerations play a huge role. Otherwise, you would be accused of weakness. In order to act otherwise, you either have to win overwhelming support or there must be a chance in mentality. When people will understand that it's much more beneficial to look for compromises than to impose your will on everyone. But it certainly takes time to change those patterns of thinking in any country. In this case, it's the US. First and foremost, this change should take place in the minds of the ruling elite, in the broad sense of this phrase. I don't think that it's impossible. I think we've almost come to that point. I very much hope we'll reach it soon. Thank you, Mr. Putin.